Hello everybody. Um, my name's Liz Stokes and I am very happy to welcome you back to the um, final instalment of our Q&A live uh, webinar for the Fair Data 101 Express course. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which we are um, meeting today. For me, that is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, uh, and I um, would like to acknowledge that they are the traditional custodians of our land and pay my respects to um, owners past, present and emerging. And a special welcome to any um, people of First Nations who are with us today. So let's get into this Fair Data 101 Express. It's nearly the end. Uh, and today we're going to focus on reusable as a theme, um, theme of the Fair uh, Data Principles. And I'm going to make sure I, slowly I will make my way across to the next slide. Um, I hope you've been keeping up with us, um, but Fear not if you feel like you've um, fallen behind a little and you um, haven't seen, you've missed a, a webinar or two and haven't made it all the way through the activities. We'll keep this course open um, and the Slack channel open for an, another couple of weeks after we officially finish at the end of this week. So you've got some time, you've got an extension, if you will, to, um, to wrap up. So because you know, um, life happens uh, and timelines um, have uh, an innate flexibility in them, I understand today. And that is why with this recognition of life happening, um, we turn our attention to reusability of research data because once you start looking at how you actually make some data, you've got some data to make reusable and you try to reuse it, it's only then does um, uh, does your engagement with how these fair principles actually work um, really come into play. So we've got a couple of awesome guests today. We have Maria Del Mar Caroga from the University of Melbourne, uh, who's a researcher there, and she's going to talk to us about her experience um, wrangling some Medicare data. And we also have Tom Honeyman, who is the software program manager at uh, the Australian Research Data Commons and he is going to talk to us about um, some of his experiences managing research data um, in his former life as a linguist. So which comes out every now and again and we've had many long talks on linguistic tangents. So I would like to um, yeah crack on with the show uh, today. So Ma, um, I welcome you to to join us, turn on your camera uh, and um, give you the floor. So I'll turn my camera off and be quiet. Oh no, I'm not gonna be able to share my screen, but that's all right. Um, so I wanted to talk about uh, my experience last year working with Medicare data. So I'm currently a research data specialist at Melbourne Data Analytics Platform at the University of Melbourne. But last year I was working at the Burnett Institute, which is a medical research institute that's right next to the Alfred Hospital in the alcohol and other drugs um, group. So it turns out the Victorian government um, started a trial and opened Melbourne's first medically supervised injecting room in July of 2018. And the injecting room had uh, a number of different aims and objectives. Uh, the main one being, of course, um, preventing opioid overdose um, and being able to attend, uh, prevent uh, opioid overdose deaths uh, within people who inject drugs. Um, but some of, of the aims were, were a little bit more uh, complex than that. So for example, one of the aims was to um, advance the delivery of more effective health services for clients of the supervised injecting room because it provides um, an easy gateway to health and, and social services. Um, it's co-located with the North Melbourne Community Health Centre and also to reduce the spread of bloodborne diseases amongst uh, the, the clients of, of the MSER is medically supervised injecting room, sorry. So the Victorian government set up an independent review panel to evaluate these aims and, and to see one year into the operation whether the, the room was um, satisfying these objectives. 
Um, and that's when they came to us. So my, my group, the Alcohol and Other Drugs Group at the Burnett Institute had a prospective cohort study on people who inject drugs called Supermix. Um, so they've been following up people who inject drugs for over 10 years. Once a year, they do an extensive interview where they ask about drug use patterns and health services utilization, um, and they get consent to link all of this self-report data to um, uh, record linkage data like Medicare or PBS or ambulances, hospitals, um, emergency departments, etc. So when the MSER was about to open, uh, they added a few questions specifically about the supervised injecting room. Uh, do people visit it uh, for what proportion of their injections and things like that? So uh, the, Victoria, the independent review panel kind of subcontracted us, given the, the richness of the data that we had, to see if we could help them answer some of these questions that required kind of a comparison between people who visit the room and people who don't to see if people, once they start visiting the room, they access health services better and there is a reduced spread of, of bloodborne diseases like hepatitis C or HIV. So we wanted to be able to look at changes over time for uh, GP visits is, in particular is what we were interested in and also uh, hepatitis C testing and maybe some other pathology results that have to do with, with drugs of abuse. So we received uh, linked data from Medicare MBS, Medi Medical Benefits Scheme, uh, for all of the participants of our study, uh, covering the, the range from January of 2008 to March of 2019. And so we really wanted to look at this before and after the room opened and be able to know uh, from this data, is there a difference between uh, the clients who were visiting the injecting room regularly to perform their injections and those who weren't? So we received 442,000 records that linked to about 1,150 participants in our analysis sample. So uh, the, the, how this data looks is you get um, an item, a Medicare item number, and there's oh, 13,500 different possible item numbers. Um, so each row has a Medicare item number, a, a date in which this service happened, information about co-payments, clinic codes, doctor codes, and things like that. So each record can be um, of, of multiple nature. So they can be to do with professional attendances. So it can be visits to the GP, the dentist, specialists, but also there's different item numbers for different kinds of GP visits. So after hours has a different number or depending on the length of the visit, it has a different number, et cetera. Um, records can also be to do with diagnostic procedures, for example, an echocardiography or something to, to check um, heart function. Uh, therapeutic procedures, for example, any surgery can be listed there in Medicare. Uh, diagnostic imaging like radiographies. Uh, pathology results like blood or urine tests. And also there's a bunch of miscellaneous or administrative codes that have to do with the management of bulk, bulk build services. So we had to be able to make sense of, of these 450,000 records and see which ones of those corresponded to the things we were interested in, namely GP visits in particular um, and hepatitis C testing um, material. So I, I wanted to show you on the screen, sorry, I, I didn't set up my permissions on my computer properly for GoToWebinar before this meeting, but I'll just describe it to you. What we received initially from Medicare together with uh, the data for our participants um, was an Excel sheet, which had for each Medicare uh, item number, and again, there's 13,500 of these, a big text description of what that Medicare number means. So for example, for 0001, it's professional attendance by a general practitioner on one patient on one occasion, each attendance other than an attendance in unsociable hours in an after hour period. If the attendance is requested by the patient, you get the idea. It's a big, big paragraph describing in a human readable way what that item number means. But if I now need to go into my big data set with uh, 450,000 records and be able to pick out from there which ones are GP visits, that was very difficult to do with just that information. Um, 
importantly, the numbers are not sequentially ordered. They've been kind of added the item numbers as things have kind of been changing in Medicare. So maybe the first five are to do with GP visits, but then there's 10 that are to do with specialist visits. And then there's another five that have to do with radiography. And then there's 10 that have to do. So it was really, really difficult. Uh, I spent a full day trying to get at, look up the, the individual item numbers to see which ones corresponded to different kinds of GP visits. And that was like, I, I spent a full day doing this. And so I thought there must be a better way to do this. <laughs> and so I approached a, a colleague at, at that point, I was doing this analysis within the Australian Institute of Fam a Secure Environment in the Australian Institute of Family Studies, given the sensitive nature of this data. Uh, and so I approached a colleague there who had experience working with Medicare data. And he said, I've been exactly where you are. Look, have a look at this link. And so he sent me a very obscure link that was somewhere in the Medicare website, but very, very difficult to find, that had a text file that ended up being a little bit more useful uh, than, than the, the data dictionary that Medicare initially sent. So this text file has a row for each Medicare item number, and it tells you for that Medicare item number, what category does it belong to? Professional attendances or diagnostic procedures or therapeutic procedures? Which subgroup, um, which which group does it correspond to? So there's there's different categories like general practitioner attendances to which no other item applies, or other non-referred attendances to which no other item applies, and and then there's an MBS subgroup, and then there's a subheading, and so all of this um, I think you would call it a vocabulary potentially, or a taxonomy, like a hierarchy of all the different um, items and how they're grouped. Um, once you can you can merge that into the initial the original data set and add columns uh, depending on the item number, what category is it, which subcategory, which subgroup, and have these descriptions. So then now I could easily say, please uh, return filter all the records that are GP visits and only GP visits alone, and then I can split that for for participants who have visited the injecting room and those who haven't, um, and be able to do the analysis that I'm uh, that I needed to do. So I think this is an example that was that was quite um, eye opening to me to understand because at, at the beginning I did I did the previous uh, round of of the fair data course, and at the beginning I kept thinking that reusability meant open. I kept getting confused between those two concepts, reusability meaning that anybody can use it, but, re but it doesn't mean necessarily that anybody can use it. It just means that you can use it for different kinds of research questions. So in this case, obviously Medicare data is not collected for the research purposes that I had in mind, but it could be quite useful for my research purposes. I just needed to, to have a relatively easy way to be able to filter out and, and get the information that I needed. Um, so I don't know if my conversations with the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare had anything to do with this because I obviously explained this um, extensively, but now if you go to the Medicare website today, this kind of hard to find more helpful data table is now there featured in, in their main website. And so that's that's probably made all the people looking into COVID stuff and other research questions made life a lot easier for them. So that's my experience that I wanted to share with you. I can't hear hey. you, Liz. Yeah, you can. Thanks. <laughs> um, took me a while to unmute myself. Sometimes it's finding the buttons. Ma, yes. thanks for that really interesting um, story and deep dive into Medicare data. Uh, it sounds like um, I think that that's research impact right there um, uh, with the changes to the AIHW page. Um, I'm going to, what I'm going to do is hand over to Tom right now and then we'll go into our Q&A session. So Tom, uh, matching ARDC jumpers, yes, um, take it away. Uh, hi everyone, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, a a slightly different scenario, uh, how um, reusability works in the area of um, field linguistics or descriptive linguistics. So um, for a little bit of context, um, uh, this is the uh, 
this is essentially people who are studying um, the world's languages, of which there are roughly about 7,000, um, uh, but the uh, use of those languages is in decline. Um, and uh, I think the statistic is roughly that one every fortnight uh, around the world uh, ceases to be spoken um, anymore. Uh, and so uh, there is a strong uh, imperative there for reuse uh, uh, for those people that are going out and collecting data. So I was one of those people. Um, I used to work in Papua New Guinea on a uh, one of the many hundreds of languages that are spoken there. Uh, and um, so like a good field linguist, all my materials are archived um, in, um, in a couple of different archives. Um, and you should be able to find them um, pretty easily uh, if you start looking for uh, materials in Mommel, uh, uh, or um, you can be even more accurate. So. Um, so um, what I wanted to particularly drill down into is um, the, the principles under reusable and how they play out in this field and what they enable. Um, and hopefully what I'm going to spell out is that sometimes it's not as complicated uh, and sometimes the value of what you're doing in this space is actually uh, more than you would realise for a simple piece of metadata. Um, so uh, uh, there are some Specific uh, keywords, uh, sorry, there are some specific um, um, vocabularies that are used for um, this kind of linguistics. Um, and um, first and foremost amongst them is that we like to identify the languages of content and study um, in any uh, materials that we're archiving. Um, and this allows people to basically look at the almost the entire extent of uh, materials that exist for a given language. Um, there's a special portal that all of the, um, the specialist archives that do uh, record language materials um, uh, publish feeds to, and that's, um, you can go there by going to um, search.language-archives.org. Um, and um, because all of the records are um, uh, have metadata capturing their um, the uh, language of focus and language uh, of content, uh, you can be sure to search for um, the language that you want. Um, and if you want to, you can use the three letter um, ISO 639-3 um, code uh, to do that. And that's particularly useful because it just so happens that um, languages around the world, sometimes the same name pops up uh, more than once. Um, there's lots of reasons for that. Um, so having that really good quality specific metadata is really important for locating materials. And so if you look on this website, um, then you'll generally find all of the recordings uh, that you want for, for a given language. Now, this is amazing uh, for reuse, um, but it doesn't stop there. Um, I'm, I'm not going to delve into um, what would be accessibility issues around um, access and authorization, but there are, the, there are concerns there. But um, generally speaking, um, there's, uh, people have gone to the trouble of putting on a um, relevant, clear and accessible data license for a lot of stuff. So the, in particular for the, um, the archive that I use, which is um, Paradisec, uh, there are standard uh, licensing um, uh, Dropbox that you can choose um, uh, depending on how open you want the uh, material to be. So I've got lots of material up there, which is uh, freely accessible. Um, please don't criticize my um, Tokpisan pronunciation. Um, and um, that uh, means that people can go in there, they can listen to the recordings, they can look at the transcripts of the text, um, uh, they can um, cite the materials, there's details there um, available to do that. Um, and in particular, um, there are a couple of key fields um, that um, really help with the um, provenance of the materials. So, when you're really drilling down into um, study of these languages, you do actually care which area um, the language was spoken in. And so reasonably specific geographic details are actually really useful um, for understanding um, differences between uh, dialects, for instance. Um, understanding the type of text um, is uh, really important too. So there, this is a bit wonky, but in the field of linguistics, there's a 
um, a distinction made between elicited materials and, and so-called naturally occurring materials. Um, and uh, so a lot of texts are actually flagged as being one type or the other, or, well, actually there's a whole um, a set, uh, there's a whole vocabulary for it, um, for describing the different types of, um, of text. Um, and so, you know, um, depending on what type of linguistics you're doing, you might be more wary about um, uh, incorporating elicited texts into your analysis. Um, and um, so these all basically fall into um, domain relevant community standards. Uh, for, uh, for linguistic archives, there's a, um, there's the um, Open Language Archive Community um, Standard, which is basically, for those in the know, is basically DC terms with a couple of extra fields added on um, that really, really, really help um, locate exactly what you're after um, when you're going to look for those materials. Um, so, um, yeah, that's, that's about it, I would say, for linguistics. I'm happy to answer any uh, questions, um, but yeah. An example of things working reasonably well. Wonderful. Thank you, Tom. Uh, and as um, thanks, Matthias, for putting those links into the chat for us. Um, and so now we come to the um, Q and A session for real. Um, finally, uh, so I encourage everyone to put in some questions into the uh, into your question box down the panel there, and I'll invite Ma back on. Um, Matthias, you could turn on your um, webcam too if you would like, give people a wave. Um, and um, I look forward to hearing what our participants have to say about uh, both of your experiences. Um, in the meantime, I will say thank you very much for sharing those. Um, Ma, I've got your um, uh, I've got your presentation up on my other screen if you would like to. Did you want to just talk people briefly through that? Or we could, I'm happy to publish these slides yeah, afterwards if that's okay. All right. Yeah, they're just screenshots of what it looked like, just to give an idea. Uh, excellent. Hang on, I'll come back to show screen two. That's moved everything across. Um, okay, can, can people so, see that screen? Yeah, so the last yeah, okay. two slides. Sure, okay, so that's the, I'll move over here and use my correct one. So this is um, your summary of what was going on and how that um, that data had moved across. And so you, actually I might move over to the, the better looking slide, the more useful data dictionary slide. And so here's the data that's nice and structured and you can see, you get to see all of its context. Whereas yeah. if we went back to that previous one, um, it's all you've got is because it's a data dictionary, you have um, you can see that there's similar content there, but it's very hard to look at that at scale. Is that was that, was exactly. that the experience you had? So so with the other one, if I'm interested in GP visits, I could say show me all the records for which the category is one and the subcategory is A01. And then that covers right. all GP visits. And I don't have to mess with individual item numbers of which there were hundreds and scattered all over at the range of zero to 1,300 and 500. Right, awesome. Um, so I, um, I can't see any questions that have come in from our participants yet, unless somebody Thank else can, have. oh, that's because Actually, I'm a. I'm. I think my permissions are as presenter, so I can't see a thing. Matthias, uh, I'm going to okay. hand this over to you. <laughs> sure. Um. I. I will quickly make you an organizer so you can see the questions. But we do have a few, and I will start reading them out. Um. So we have a question about sensitive data. So I suspect this could go to both Ma and Tom. Uh, are there any special considerations to be taken into account? to make sensitive data reusable by other researchers. Ma, maybe you'd um, like to go first? Yeah. Do you want to stop sharing the screen, Liz? So, yes. Yeah. Um, yes, there are a lot of considerations that can be taken into account. Um, so depending on the level of sensitivity of the data, 
the data custodians will have different requirements in terms of the security of the environment in which this data can be made available. Uh, so Medicare, PBS, etc. Obviously, they are de-identified. There's no personal information on there about people, but it is so sensitive that they have pretty strong requirements about uh, the environment in which it could be accessed. So in our case, we had to sit in the Australian Institute of Family Studies, which is an accredited link linkage uh, service, uh, belongs to the uh, part of the Australian government, um, and sit there with laptops that were not connected to any network. So they had no internet access, they had no USB access either. And so the data was saved into these physical laptops and we had to go there to the physical location in a room and work on those laptops without access to the internet. Um, other types of sensitive data can have different requirements. Um, and so it, it really depends on the conditions of the data custodians, but usually most data will be de-identified before being made available for research. Uh, right. Sorry, yeah, Tom, go on. Yeah, whereas uh, in my uh, case, it, it's sometimes the opposite um, scenario. So it may not be that the personally identifiable details is, is the concern. Um, it might be that the materials that you've collected are culturally sensitive um, and have particular restrictions on access. Um, that can, uh, like a common scenario is that if you're dealing with uh, women's or men's business, um, uh, you, you may not be able to view the materials or, or listen to them um, if that's the case. Um, and uh, so how this is handled in linguistics is that um, you go right back to the consent form when you're gathering the data um, and there, it's very important to discuss with the, um, with the community more generally um, about how they feel about access to the information that you're gathering. Um, and they indicate at the time whether they want to um, uh, uh, restrict access um, to the materials and what kinds of restrictions there may be. So um, if it's culturally sensitive material, um, then uh, you may well want to um, uh, you may well want to put in place a, a protocol for um, uh, gaining permission from the, um, the community uh, to access those materials before you do. Uh, so it's not, that's not uh, stopping reuse, uh, but it is a barrier to reuse. Um, but generally speaking, I did also talk uh, a lot about the value of reuse um, with the community um, uh, so that they um, could understand what it was for and why it was there. Um, and there's actually significant interest um, in this realm for um, realm, uh, realm uh, for uh, uh, re reuse of the kind where other people in the community can actually access the materials from the archive uh, afterwards as well. So it um, can be generally quite good for people to be able to use it. But yeah, different different concerns, mm. sometimes the opposite. It's really interesting when it gets into that uh, realm of community use, uh, you know, not just for researchers, by researchers. Um, thank you, Ma, for describing that experience. Um, we have a question um, about is the AIHW any help with the data extraction and usability process? Um, this question, this commenter notes they know they create an atlas of Australian healthcare variation which maps the variation in example surgery in different states. I wonder if you had any further comment on that. Um, so the AIHW is a linkage authority. It's a certified linkage authority by the by the government. So what they can do is, in our case, they handled the whole linkage process for us. So we sent them our full data set of um, self-report interviews to our participants. And also, I don't have access to this, but I personally identifiable information of these participants so that they could actually do the linkage to the Medicare information and PBS and ambulance and, and um, emergency departments, hospitals, the National Death Index, everything. Um, so they remove all the personally identifiable information and they put a unique identifier on each of these things so that you can connect across the data sets. Um, I don't know if that actually answers the question, but they are one of many um, certified linkage authorities in Australia. So depending on the type of data that you want to get access to, uh, you might want to contact them or other 
um, organizations. So for for health in, for health um, information in Australia, also BioGrid is one that's that's emerging in more the university space as well. So there, yeah, there's a bunch of different linkage groups. Thanks. All right, I'm going to go, there's a question towards more data and government agencies and then we'll cycle back to um, talking about um, some questions that came up for Tom. So, um, is there a way to influence how data is displayed by government agencies? Um, is, there a, is there a formal website um, to show those who are not making their public data available in usable formats. It would nice. It would be nice to have a gentle method to show the way rather than rely on individual researchers having to do this. Agreed. I don't know if I can add much to that, that I think the work the ARDC is doing is amazing to raise awareness in general um, about these things, but I don't know that there's, I don't know of any specific process for feeding this back up. Uh, maybe you, Liz, or Matthias, or Tom can comment on that. Go for it, Matthias. Uh, so I do know that uh, many of the state governments uh, and the federal government as well do have specific open government, open data projects. Um, so you can visit, say, uh, data.gov.au or data.wa.gov.au. Um, so there are efforts within uh, government jurisdictions to make more government data open and available um, whilst yeah uh, and they do focus on open rather than necessarily fair at this stage um, but that is uh, I, I think it's it's a process uh, things will will proceed different departments have different levels of uh, how conservative they might be when it comes to safeguarding their data uh, so I would say give it time. <laughs> yes, it's definitely a long game. And as we track the process of the landscape changing, um, you know, glaciers move. So government, um, governments and it's, research institutions can also adapt to changing circumstances. I'm not gonna be writing speeches for politicians anytime soon. Okay, I'm going to come back um, to Tom. Um, the question, the previous studies in your thesis area, did you find them reusable to the same extent? And has, ha, for, so otherwise, in other words, has reusable um, changed over time as a concept? Uh, massively. I, I think um, the, uh, the critical turning point in, in my field was about the year 2000 um, when there was a UNESCO report on um, endangered languages or language endangerment uh, and that really galvanized the community to act uh, in this space and to do a lot more work uh, archiving and going back in particular if, if you look at Paradisic um, uh, it did a, a huge amount of work recovering uh, recordings from old reel-to-reel -reel recorders uh, and other obscure formats um, that were dating very quickly um, and um, but it still remains that there is um, well the practices in 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 the uh, area have changed a lot as well so uh, data citation uh, started to be taken very seriously at that time um, and it's far more common to see specific references to the um, to the text um, that you're um, that you're uh, quoting um, uh, included in line in the document that you're doing um, so um, the materials, so I have, I pretty much did hunt down every single um, existing bit of work on the language that I worked on. Uh, there was a missionary linguist who worked in the area in the uh, late seventies and early eighties. Um, he didn't have a lot of stuff archived, um, but he did have uh, a few papers floating around. Um, and uh, I wasn't ever really able to cite the original texts um, for those, but if I'd been able to, that would have been an absolute treasure trove, um, uh, basically. Uh, and, you know, right down to um, one of the most obscure things I found was a, um, there was an, um, an evangelizing group that went around making recordings in local language. Um, and they put, they started to digitize their tapes and put them up and um, I accessed those and, uh, I've had speakers in the community who said, oh yeah, that's, you know, 
that's uh, Phywos in um, in Amanab. Um and so I could sort of work out backwards from there uh, who the speakers were, where they were based, um, what dialect they were speaking. Um, in some cases, well, actually, it's pretty much the core evidence for me to know that there is in fact two dialects of the language I was working on, um, and I wouldn't have been able to work that out otherwise. Um, but yeah, um, so it really has changed over time. It, it's fantastic. Mm, it just goes to see how many different, I guess, I don't want to call them interest groups, but people with different perspectives and things to um, things to add that actually contribute to the research that happens. So Tom, another question, how do you handle language when the 639 code does not exist? Yeah, so there um, is a process for amending um, those uh, those codes, um, unless you mean uh, it's a language that doesn't exist, um, uh, in which case, uh, uh, or a language of one or something like that. But there is a process basically for um, submitting changes, um, and and so if you uh, if you have so a lot of these a lot of the languages um, of the well. Uh, increasingly fewer languages of the world um, have had almost no work uh, done on them or uh, no, no sort of, you know, um, formal work done on them or, or had the care taken to work out whether they are distinct languages or whether they're dialects or um, a, a beyond um, sometimes just a, a, a list of maybe a hundred words. Um, um, and so um, the the status of um, languages um, uh, actually changes a bit um, and is is sometimes contested. And so there is a process for basically um, submitting uh, a change request um, to that um, to the authority. Um, yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, also. I'd like to note, um, panelists, that we've um, had a couple more comments in there about the discussion on um, uh, uh, changes in how the government, how government agencies make data available. Um, and there's a comment about the Office of the National Data Commissioner um, being made aware of those um, uh, what's going on, and also that um, that. Uh, the National Data Commissioner is also ad advised by Australia's chief scientist, who has come out um, recently um, being quite um, enthusiastic about um, data sharing and open data. So, um, uh, hooray! Um, that's, that's good. Um, I'm going to move to a comment now about um, general, um, a comment about data licensing. And uh, so, which is actually probably good on, you know, my fairly flippant comment about yay for open um, open data. I do acknowledge that sometimes it is possible and sometimes it's not that possible. And I don't think absolutely every data set needs to be um, open and public. Um, so this, this question asks, in particular, looking at the benefits of CC0, so um, public domain or try, um, attempting to put research data in the public domain because as we know there's a little uh, there's a little bit of tension there with Australian copyright law so in terms of using the cc0 rather than requiring attribution which might get messy as more and more data sets get used and um, uh, combined um, over the years um, thinking thinking in terms of 10 to 15 years from the original sources. Would you, either of you, like to make any comment on that? Specifically in linguistics, it, it's unlikely. Um, uh, the data itself, um, there's some complexities there, but the, um, uh, the, um, the convention is actually to recognize the although it's not recognized in traditional IP law to recognize the rights of the people um, who are speaking that language as the owners of those materials um, and leaving that attribution in there um, is an important link back to that um, as is the the possibility of shifting access rights over time so you're not going to see CC0 anytime well apart from the the issue with CC0 in Australia yeah 
Yes, um, Matthias and Ma. Um, yeah, so I just wanted to expand on that issue with CC0 uh, in Australia because the attendees might not be aware of that. Um, so, uh, sorry, I should preface this with, I am not a lawyer, but <laughs> um, CC0 is an instrument that attempts to put things or make it easier for people to put things in the public domain and therefore essentially completely give up all of their rights associated with a creative output of some kind. Now, the problem with that in Australia is that, sorry, as far as I'm aware, as not a lawyer, you actually cannot legally give up your moral rights to something. So your moral rights are what protect you and your creative outputs from misuse by others. Um, you can waive, sorry, you can't waive. Um, you can give people permission to reuse something and, and possibly broach your moral rights without any kind of uh, legal action from you, but that's not something you can do on a, a blanket basis, uh, as far as I'm aware. Um, now, if there are any uh, lawyers present who know, who can articulate that better than I can, that would be fantastic, but I would definitely advise caution with trying to use CC0 uh, in Australia. But then I also think that then uh, by not requiring attribution, we, to me, that feels like we're flying in the face of academia, which is all about acknowledging sources, where things came from. Um, I mean, I'm sure it can make things easier because you just reuse something. You don't worry about who you need to acknowledge or what have you, but yeah, uh, it does it, is it really compatible with academia? Yeah, and I just wanted to add something exactly about that. Um, I'm working in the Melbourne Data Analytics platform as an academic specialist. So it's kind of a new career path that sits somewhere in between traditional academic roles um, and professional roles. And a lot of what we're doing is trying to figure out how can we get recognition within academia for maybe some more non-traditional research outputs. So we don't necessarily write a lot of papers because we collaborate with researchers in a bunch of different domains to apply computational um, kind of data science, cutting edge data science techniques to their research problems. So in that sense, I'm thinking um, it's important to have use licenses that, that remain, that retain that attribution of, of your contribution to this. Uh, just, just thinking about career paths and, and, and making cases for promotion and, and things like that. If you create, if you collect a big data set, you want that to count as an academic output. Um, that was all I wanted to add about that. Fabulous. Thank you. I, I guess also um, with the uh, thinking about um, uh, the absence of attribution, it's great for ideas, but probably not for for that long tail of provenance. Um, I guess that's the difference between a research paper and a zine. And I, you know, love the freedom of a zine to not have to provide citation appropriately and you can literally cut and paste things together and make beautiful artworks. Um, meaningful in a completely different sense-making world. Uh, so with that, um, I would like to thank our presenters expert panel very much um, for your your stories and answers today um, for our questions on reusability uh, and um, thank everybody here in our all our attendees um, for making it through to the final Q and a live session. So what we've um, what we've got oh I'll just draw your attention to the ARDC rights, research data rights management guide that Matthias has shared in the chat there. Uh, please get in touch with us if you have further um, questions about rights management and sharing research data. We'd be more than happy to answer or get stuck in the weeds with you. Um, we are going to, as, as usual, there will be a short um, feedback survey on this particular um, uh, webinar so we really appreciate your feedback on that but I would like to since this is the last time I get to actually talk to you face to face or I suppose face to screen that um, we also have a um, full course evaluation survey um, that I think Matthias is going to pop into the chat s somewhere or I will 
scroll through and find my reference to that and share with you. Um, if you, we've tied the course evaluation survey to um, the form that you fill out if you would like a sticker and a certificate posted to you in recognition of the completion of this course and I thoroughly recommend that you do that. So um, please, oh thank you, thanks Matthias. So please tell us about your experience of the whole course. As I said at the beginning, we'll keep the Slack channel open for another fortnight but please be aware that we will deactivate you and I know that sounds a little bit harsh. Um, those are the terms of the Slack platform. Uh, we could talk to them about that too. Uh, so we'll deactivate your membership there um, after two weeks, so on October the 15th. There's your deadline. So I do recommend, you know, getting on board there and, um, you know, striking up a conversation about reusability, interoperability, accessibility and um, findability um, with regards to research data. But as it's now um, 12.46, it's probably time for me to say goodbye. So thank you very much everyone for staying the course with us uh, and let us know how you go uh, in those surveys. Thank you.